the limbic system. When I first heard about the limbic system, I thought it had something to do with my limbs. I thought it had something to do with mobility. I started to learn that the limbic system is your brain and your brain's ability to be able to delegate different tasks, but also receive information and process it correctly. And what does this have to do with health, wellness, and getting in shape? Well, a lot more than you might think. In fact, I would go so far as saying it is the end-all be-all when it comes down to it. You see, today I'm going to talk about the limbic system and how you can start making some changes to your limbic system to help you get in better shape, to help you make better decisions. But first off, we have to understand what exactly the limbic system is. The limbic system is a series of complex structures, of nerves and everything like that that sit at the top of your brainstem. Okay? It's made up of three primary components. We're talking about the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. Now, there are a lot of other components of the limbic system as well, but we're going to focus on these three today. Now, the limbic system for a long time has been known as the paleomammalian cortex. The reason it's called the paleomammalian cortex is because it's believed to have been the first part of the brain that was ever developed. And the reason is, it was purely a survival component of the brain. You see, this paleomammalian cortex was designed to receive input from the external world and process it for survival, fear, anger, everything like that, things that need to be known. Also, simple things like keeping the lungs functioning and the brain functioning in the first place. So that gives us a lot of sense as to what this actual limbic system does for us today. It processes emotional events and it allows us to register them so that we can live life, so that we can form habits, so we can know what feels good, so we can know what feels bad, and so we can know what works for us in the future. So now you can start to see how this plays a big role in how we get in shape. How many times have you ever gone to the pantry or gone to the refrigerator and just had no idea what you were doing? You just stop all of a sudden and realize that you're just munching on food. Well, it's a perfect example of the limbic system being a little bit out of whack. Your habit formation is totally out of whack. Okay, so before I talk about the big three, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala, I want to talk about a couple other small subsections of the limbic system that I'm going to save for other videos. The first one is the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus focuses attention on emotional events. That's the purpose of that one. Okay, then we have the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is the habit formation. The basal ganglia is everything that allows us to cause repetitive motion, repetitive thought, repetitive action in our body. Those are the simple things like, why am I eating? Why am I doing this? Or why do I have these weird little habits. Like I have this one interesting tick where a lot of times I kind of pull on my hair and my sideburn. That's a perfect example of the basal ganglia being a little bit out of whack because it's triggering just this kind of repetitive motion. Again, we're going to save it for another video. Then we've got the ventral tegmental area. The ventral tegmental area is strongly associated with the dopamine responses. Dopamine is our feel good or reward sense. If we have issues with our ventral tegmental system, that makes it so that we're having a disruption in the dopamine system in what actually feels good or what doesn't feel good. Then we have the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is everything that's involved with future thinking. So does that sound familiar? Thinking about the future equals anxiety a lot of times. So in large prefrontal cortexes and very highly active prefrontal cortexes like we have in this day and age, really have a strong correlation with anxiety. Again, I'm going to save all that for another video. So let's get right down to the big three. The first one I want to start with is the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus is arguably the busiest part of the brain. Its job is to find homeostasis. And although that sounds like a nice peaceful endeavor, well, the hypothalamus quite literally is the peace core of the body, which is a lot of work. It's constantly trying to find balance. That's what homeostasis is. It's trying to find balance with our hormones. It's trying to find balance with our emotions. It's trying to find balance with our overall digestion, with our breathing, with just about everything that we can think of. It truly is the epicenter or the CEO of the body. We can even go so far as saying that it's going to regulate our hunger. It's going to regulate our thirst. It's going to regulate our bowel movements. It's going to regulate everything that you can think about, big and small. So that is why it's so important. Now there's a couple of interesting ways the hypothalamus works. Okay, the hypothalamus has receptors. Receptors that receive input from every area of our body, even from our fat cells. I've done videos talking about leptin before. Leptin is a component that allows the fat to communicate with the brain to let the brain know how much fat is on hand, therefore if we can turn up the metabolism or not. All the way down to the fat cells. So we've got the fat cells, the digestive system, all this sends signals to the hypothalamus which has receptors to receive input and then delegate tasks accordingly. Okay. The other thing that the hypothalamus does is it gives instruction. That's part two. So it can either give instruction through the autonomic nervous system where it says, hey, lungs, breathe, or blood pressure, elevate or decrease, or stomach, secrete juices, or muscles, move, or it can delegate its task out to the pituitary. So it can tell the pituitary gland to create hormones or to pump out what are called releasing factors. These releasing factors trigger other areas of our body to release hormones. So you see the hypothalamus really works full time. It's always busy, it's always on, even when you're asleep. Because those autonomic nervous system functions like breathing, like blood pressure, like heart rate, those never stop. 
So if our hypothalamus is fatigued or has issues or it's not getting the right blood flow or the right kind of energy, it can really throw off so many things in our body. Okay, now let's talk about the second portion, the hippocampus. The hippocampus is everything that has to do with memory and categorizing memory. But it's not just about memories in general. It's not the storage bank itself. What it does is it categorizes memories based on given stimuli. So it takes certain events that we have and it stores them in the cerebral cortex so that we can access them later. For example, if you run into a situation that's very, very important and it has to be categorized so that you remember it, it's the job of the hippocampus to do that. So let's say, for example, you run into a situation where it's a scary situation, you have to develop fear for something. Well, the hippocampus is going to say, OK, fear, let's register this in the cerebral cortex so that next time you run into this situation, you can easily access it and you have it available so your body knows how to respond. The other thing the hippocampus does is it responds to senses. We're talking about smell, we're talking about taste, we're talking about noise, we're talking about even vision. So it allows us to make that connection between an actual situation and the different senses that are involved in it. A good example would be touching a hot burner on the stove. Okay? The hippocampus, again, is going to register that really quick, and it's going to be able to categorize it in the right place. So that's where that comes into play, especially when it comes down to making diet choices, too. We associate good feelings with good tasting food. So if the hippocampus is overactive or even underactive, it can cause us to develop totally skewed responses to foods that cause habits to form, that cause the hypothalamus to trigger an autonomic nervous system response to make us just want to do that all the time. Starting to see the connection here? Okay, now let's move into the amygdala. See, the amygdala gauges emotional response, and it also gauges the severity of emotional responses. So basically what I mean by that is, the amygdala can see how intense a given situation is and allow the brain to process it how it should. Again, I'm gonna use fear in this example. The body doesn't need to see fear a whole lot to learn that fear is bad. So I'm gonna use the stove burner again for an example. If you go ahead and you touch a hot burner on a stove, it likely only takes you one time to truly learn that that hurts and you don't want to do that again. Well, that's because the amygdala has registered that that is something that needs a lot more of a response. Whereas something that might be a positive experience might take 10, 12, 15 different repetitions before your brain registers that that feels good and you want to do it again. See, there's different gauges. The brain sees different things as having different levels of intensity and different importance factors in the brain. Fear has a higher importance factor because it all has to do with survival, keeping us alive. Positive reward, although it feels good, isn't always necessary to keep us alive. It's just ingrained in our minds and we're pre-programmed to really stay alive, which means we just have to avoid fear. So you can see again how this relates to food and how it relates to exercise. If we instill a lot of fear about food, it's going to make us avoid certain foods. If we look at a given diet food as something that's a little bit scary because we don't want to go there, then our body doesn't really embrace it because the amygdala is telling us that we should be afraid of that, making it very, very hard to form these habits and store the memories from the hippocampus to create the autonomic nervous system response from the hypothalamus. It's totally seeing the connection now. Now I want to take a look at a study. Okay, this one has to do with curcumin because there's not a whole lot of things that you can do from a sort of an extrinsic factor to help your brain, but curcumin is one of them. There are a lot of things you can do in the ways of meditation, in the way of mindset therapies and everything like that to start conditioning your limbic system better. But one study that was really interesting looking at curcumin just kind of blew my hair back. This study was published by the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. And they took a look at 40 different participants ranging from the ages of 50 to 90. And what they did is for 18 months, they had half of these people consume curcumin that was easily absorbed. And they had another half of the participants not consume any curcumin. Now, at the beginning of the study, they had them do a cognitive assessment. They also had them do positon emission topography testing, also known as a PET scan that you've probably heard of before. It looks at the topography of the brain to determine where amyloid plaque is, but also where given activity is in the brain. So they did this at the beginning, and then they did it at the end, at the end of the 18 months. Okay? What they found was that those that ended up taking the curcumin ended up having significantly less amyloid plaque buildup in the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, but also the amygdala meaning that they were having a smoother response and able to store memories that much easier, which ended up making sense that they ended up having a 28% increase in memory. Those that didn't consume the curcumin ended up staying right at baseline. So we showed there is actually a physical correlation between the plaque that ends up building up in our brain and actual memory and function of the limbic system. So yeah, it may just have to do with Alzheimer's and dementia in this given study, but think about how that plays a role with how you choose your given food makes a huge, huge difference. And a lot of us only want to think about Alzheimer's and dementia as something that's way in the future and not about what it's doing to us right now when it comes to our day-to-day -day decisions. 
Anyway, this was purely an educational video. Wanted to teach you a little bit about how the limbic system works so you have an understanding of how the brain works so that I can choose to do some more in-depth videos about the brain, about mindset, about psychology in general so you can understand what makes you tick and why you eat what you eat. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. If you have ideas for future videos, make sure you hit them in the comments below. I'll see you soon.